Welcome and thank you for joining us. During this presentation, audiovisual capabilities have been turned off for attendees to limit distractions throughout the presentation. But we do encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A box function on your screen at any time. We will address questions as time permits during the roundtable discussion portion of our event today. If you are calling from a phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and ask your question. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Becca Newman and I am a project coordinator at the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice, a community-based research center that provides local communities, organizations, behavioral health and law enforcement agencies across Michigan with technical assistance, evaluation and support to optimize diversion of individuals from jail and prison through the implementation of best and innovative practices at every intercept of the criminal justice continuum. Today's event is the second of three trainings in partnership with MDHHS, providing valuable information on the implementation of the CBHJ medication assisted treatment model in the criminal legal system. This event is made possible because of the expertise provided by champion stakeholders doing this groundbreaking work. Our first expert is Director Wright Wade. He is the Director of Probation for the last eight years in the 36th District Court in Detroit, Michigan. The 36th District Court is the largest district court in the state of Michigan. The court has three primary specialty courts, drug treatment court, veterans treatment court, and mental health court. Director Wade is also the project manager over the specialty courts. The 36th District Court is a mentorship court. Um, it is recognized by the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. Director Wade also holds a master's arts degree in criminal justice and organizational management. He is retired from the Michigan Department of Corrections after 32 years as an inspector and acting deputy warden. Director Wright, you have been instrumental in improving the communities you serve and thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you so very kindly. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be before you today. Uh, what I'd like to quickly start with, uh, however, uh, many times our audiences, although we, we briefly explain about specialty courts, there's still uh, some people that still might not quite understand what specialty courts uh, are and what they do. So if I can, I'd like to make a comparison uh, with th this analogy. We all go to a primary care physician, and when we go to the primary care physician, if there's something going on, uh, then the primary care physician will send us to uh, a specialist. Well, the same thing holds in this, this type of situation with specialty courts. A person will uh, have an open misdemeanor case uh, for us, for 36th District Court, an open misdemeanor case. And as opposed to the person being placed on regular probation, uh, we find out what, what got the person in front of us in the, in the first place. And if it's something that's associated uh, with an addiction or mental health or their veteran substance abuse issues, then we put them on an entire different track when we align them with a specialty court. And then we focus on what the problem is, what the challenge is. And that's what specialty courts is. So it kind of helps people understand or have a better grasp of what specialty courts are. So there is a screening process uh, that takes place to ensure that the person uh, is a good fit and that they will benefit from it. So those people are, are what we consider uh, primarily high risk and high needs. And the, the first specialty court is our newest specialty court that we have here at the 36th District Court, and it's our mental health court. And we launched this program on July 1st of 2020 in the midst of a pandemic. And the reason specialty courts have to keep going in the midst of a pandemic is because that's when the population is the most vulnerable. I tell people when we talk to audiences such as yourself, I tell people, what would we have done in the midst of the pandemic and we've had to, if we would have had to call 911 and then the response would have been, oh, we can't help you. It's COVID, we can't help you, there's a pandemic. 
what would the response have been for an already vulnerable uh, population? It would have been even worse. So specialty courts have to operate when, when everything else is not operating. Yes, is it challenging? Absolutely. But we have to operate there. So we were able to successfully launch the mental health court on July 1st of 2020. And, and we've been going pretty good uh, ever since then to service the needs of those that suffer with uh, challenges of mental health. And some of those uh, those participants are in need of medicated uh, assisted treatment. Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm not the specialist for uh, medicated assisted treatment. But being involved in this program and all the learning and the resources that we are exposed to, we embrace the fact that medicated assisted treatment is needed for many of the addiction challenges and other challenges uh, that participants come to us for. So there is a doctor that monitors that and prescribes the medicated ass assisted treatment. And it's, it's all geared toward starting at one place and going down in dosages. Nobody stays at the same place when you come in on medicated assisted treatment. You start at one place and you end another place and hopefully you're off of it all together. But is it an advantage to it? Absolutely. The experts will tell you that. They'll be more specific with you on that. Though their requirements with all the specialty court programs, a defendant will still have to come to court. They will still have to drug test. They would have to go to counseling. Uh, could they be placed in jail at all while they're in a the program? Absolutely. For those that don't adhere to the conditions that has been set forth. It's not our goal, but sometimes a defendant has to see the inside of a jail cell. But that's not as frequent. Is it challenging? It absolutely is. We go to their homes and we go to their homes not to necessarily look under the rug or go to the attic, but to ensure that their home is conducive for them to maintain their sobriety, to make sure they're not living in harm's way that can jeopardize their progress and their growth. And that's why we're partnered uh, with law enforcement agencies because we need the law enforcement agencies as a part of this entire program to be successful. They're an integral part of this program. So there's different phases uh, to, to each specialty court uh, program. As far as the um, mental health program go, goes, the first uh, uh, phase is, is designed to be a stabilization phase. Then we have the clinical stabilization phase, pro-social habilitation, adaptive habilitation, and continuing care. And when persons are working themselves toward the end of the program, uh, the, it's not necessary that they will conclude at 12 months. It all depends on their progress. They may be with us for 14 months, 15 months, but up to 24 months. And even then, when they successfully complete this program and upon discharge, they are aligned with someone. So when they cut the ties with us, they're not just out there to fend for themselves because we have peer support specialists that continue their walk and continue their journey with them. There are incentives and there are sanctions involved with being in a specialty court program. What's an incentive? Well, it's basically a reward when they're doing something right. They should be celebrated. And applause means a lot to a person that has a heavy load. A lot of them has never been applauded or celebrated before. So even if their, their challenge is mental health, if it's a substance abuse addiction, if it's alcohol, they still need to be applauded because a little progress is still progress and progress is progress. So we applaud them. It doesn't have to be anything of a large magnitude all the time. It can be something as small as a McDonald's gift card and that can mean the world to them. So incentives is built in to this program and it's built into all of our specialty courts. Uh, they may not have to report to court twice a month. We may even, a person may, be their one of their conditions could be testing three times a week. They could be testing clean for a certain period of time. And our recommendation to the judge, who has the final authority, our recommendation to the judge may be, okay, they can only they only have to test twice this week. Those are various different types of um, sanctions that are applicable across the board in all of our specialty courts. Now, some sanctions may be increased testing or increased court hearings or a writing essay. And believe it or not, with mental health, it, it is a unique population. With mental health, a, a sanction can be taking away their video player because that means everything in the world to them. 
So those type of things is, is what we use. Those are the type of tools that are set forth by our governance. And our governance is through the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. There's key components and there's guiding principles. And those things make up all of our specialty courts. Our specialty court that, that we are really so proud of is our Veterans Treatment Court because we are serving participants that have served our country and they deserve a helping hand. And we're glad that we're here to afford them that helping hand. So they come to us and of course they would have had to serve in a branch of service to be eligible in addition to having an open uh, misdemeanor uh, here at the court which gives uh, Judge Holmes a jurisdiction for them. And it's to invite, uh, provide them additional tools and additional support. Some people say, well, why do you need a veterans court when the veterans administration uh, can help them? Well, the veterans administration can help them. And that's why we're partnered with them and we're partnered with the law enforcement agencies as well, because they still need that help. They still have to attend hearings. They may need that structure because some, some, some of the addictions of veterans treatment court are much different than that of mental health court. Or, or human trafficking or drug court. We've had people in veterans court that suffer severely with gambling addictions and sex addiction, addictions and, and trauma. And we pair them with the right appropriate treatment provider that can help them and we walk with them. And again, we have a peer mentorship that's there uh, for them to support them because a lot of times veterans relate better with other veterans. And, and you'll hear in a few minutes about uh, Judge Holmes, and she's also a veteran. So they look at that and they embrace that different than when you're not a veteran. Many veterans feel that we can't feel their pain because we haven't had to go and fight and suffer and make the sacrifices that they have made. So we relate to them. There's a, a liaison, a Veterans Treatment Court liaison that, that works for the Veterans Administration that's assigned to our program to help them every step of the way. They still have to attend court. They still have to drug test. If, if that's part of the order, the five phases are still applicable to them uh, as well. So um, we are happy, uh, very happy uh, for our Veterans uh, Treatment Court. We've had that Veterans uh, Treatment Court has been in effect since uh, 2010. And we're also a mentor court for Veterans uh, Treatment Court as well. So we're glad of that. Our um, other program is the Drug Treatment Court. And of course, it focuses on um, drug abuse and opiate addictions and, and all of those things that you've ever heard about that destroys lives. We deal with that in our Drug Treatment Court. Again, there's five phases, there's incentives, there's sanctions with this program as it is with all the other programs. However, we've had much success uh, from our special court programs and drug, the drug court program is our largest specialty court program because of the um, the drug abuse uh, that exists. Now we service people in the greater Detroit metropolitan area and somebody is outside of our jurisdiction. Often we can accept transfers from jurisdictions that are not aligned with specialty courts and that we can still help them. It's so important that police officers know that their role is so crucial to the success of specialty courts because they see and interact with the person first before anyone else. They'll interact with someone and they'll um, facilitate uh, getting the person off the street. They'll go on their furlough days and then they'll come back after their furlough days and that same person is in the same place uh, with the same offense. And then you wonder, this is just a revolving door. Well, it doesn't have to be a revolving door because if they know, if you know, and Everyone knows that has a hand in this, that specialty courts exist and why they exist, then we can all stop the revolving door by getting them to a specialty court and getting them the help they need that's closely suited for them. There's no cookie cutter in specialty court, none at all whatsoever, no cookie cutter. It's all designed. When you go to the doctor, he writes the script, he writes that script for you. And, and, and for your diagnosis and hoping to get your good prognosis from it. Well, that's what specialty courts are all about. That's what we do here at the 36th District Court. Uh, our recovery is good. We, our reset rate is good. 
Uh, we see the, the work that we've done. We see the results. It's evidence-based. We, we, we abide ourselves and adhere to the uh, 10 key components, our best practices. Uh, we go through a certification process uh, every year. All of the staff receive training, uh, in-state and out-of-state training. We're happy to become a mentor court where we get even more training, where we can assist other courts around the nation so they can come and they can work with us and they can observe us and hopefully garner uh, information garner uh, processes to take back to enhance their court. So that's the whole, uh, the greatest thing about becoming a mentor court is because we're helping other courts uh, throughout this nation. Uh, again, they come to court bi-weekly, they have a constant uh, case manager contact, and we offer job training. We treat the whole person, including medical exams, uh, dental appointments, assisting with transportation to uh, make uh, treatment uh, appointments. We treat the whole person so that the revolving door uh, is no longer a revolving door. So hopefully I've said something to uh, enlighten your knowledge about specialty courts. Um, you can always go uh, to NAGCP, which is the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, it tells you a lot about treatment courts. There's 4,000 treatment courts across this country. And we are happy and elated to say that out of the 4,000 treatment courts, 10 of the treatment courts are considered mentor courts. And 36th District Court, which is the largest district court in the state of Michigan, is one of those mentor courts. And we're happy and we're proud of it. And we are here to assist anyone at any time. If you need our service, please don't hesitate to call upon us. Thank you so much. Director Wade, that was really powerful talking about what your court offers individuals in your community to help them be successful. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Uh, next, we have the Honorable Shannon E. Holmes. The Honorable Judge Holmes has been has had a distinguished career and been serving the public over the entire course of it. Her career, both federally and locally. Um, she has served as the 36th District Court Judge since November of 2011. And she's also the presiding judge over all the specialty courts, which includes the Drug Treatment Court, the Veterans Court, and the Mental Health Court, as well as Community Court, Human Trafficking Docket, and a Street Outright Outreach Court, Detroit. Judge Holmes is also responsible for the administrative administration of restorative justice for individuals who require specialized services due to addictions and behavioral health issues. Shannon is affiliated with several civic, community, and inimical professional organizations. Thank you so much, Judge Holmes, for joining us today and sharing your work improving those struggling the most in your community. Wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here on today. I am excited. Thank you, Mr. Wade, for that excellent overview of what we do here at 36th District Court. And I want you to know he was being very modest about what goes on and the amount of work and expertise that he brings to the table with respect to our specialty courts. And so we certainly appreciate your service, Mr. Wade. And so, yes, sir. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about why specialty courts. Why are specialty courts so important? First, I'm gonna just give you a little bit of my backdrop with respect to specialty courts. I've been on the bench since 2011. And when I came to 36th District Court after having practiced law and been serving in a, an administrative capacity for 14 years, and I was in the criminal division, did some traffic, went back to criminal, exclusively criminal. And then one day I received a phone call saying that I I would be uh, taking over Judge Leonia Lloyd's docket of drug treatment court. First of all, I didn't even know we had a drug treatment court here at 36 District Court. That was the first thing. Secondly, I just knew that Judge Leonia Lloyd, that she was excellent in what she did. And I could not imagine having to fill her shoes to do anything that she was doing at 36 District Court. Nonetheless, I was recruited to come or drafted to come. And my first thought was, who did I offend? And that wasn't really what I said. That was, that's the nice clean version of what I said. But I'm like, who did I, who did I rub the wrong way? And so I came to specialty court, started off first with drug treatment court and um, decided that I said, I don't want to do this. It's too emotional. Um, people got to want help. And I had had my own experience with drug addiction. I had four brothers all battled addiction. 
Three of them battled drug addiction. And um, one was my closest brother. And, um, and, and I went through it with him. And I was a very young person at that time. And so I said, I don't want to do it. I know the games that people play. I, it's not what I want to do. Well, I connected with Mr. Wade, who had such a passion for drug treatment court. And I said, I'll give it a try. Not that I had a choice because I had been assigned to drug treatment court. I don't know what else I was going to do. I guess quit my job. I don't know. But I decided I would roll up my sleeves and work it. And it has been the best career decision that I have made in a very long time because specialty courts work. So when I came into 36th District Court, uh, drug treatment court, and we had a veterans treatment court. Those were the only two specialty courts that we really had alive and thriving. And then Judge William McConnell became our chief judge. And I indicated to him, look, we have all of these great little programs going on at 36th District Court. Everybody's kind of in their own vacuum or their own silo. Uh, and everybody's saying, we want to help the public. We want to help people. We want to decrease recidivism. And I said, we can't do it if we're not going to all come to the table and work together. And so Judge McConnell, under his leadership, indicated that it would be acceptable to bring all of the specialty courts together. And then when we saw a need for human trafficking, I said, we can't treat human trafficking drug users like we do other people that are coming to us as drug users. And we carved out a human trafficking docket, which operates on Fridays. And so now we have a specialty court division here at 36th District Court under the leadership of Judge Bill McConnell and of course, Director Ray working with us. And so we have our our drug treatment court, veterans treatment court, mental health court. We have our community court, which services Southwest Detroit specifically. We also have our homelessness court called Street Outreach Court Detroit, and we have our human trafficking docket. So specialty courts work. And I wanna make sure that people know, a lot of people don't know that help is available through the court system. Um, I travel and I go places and I talk about what we do at 36th District Court. I teach a class at Renaissance High School Criminal Justice. And the first thing when you ask the students, what do you think, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of court? They all say jail, a mean judge, and people being rude to them. That's what they say. I don't care which class I'm teaching. Uh, when I ask them, what's the first thing you think of when you talk about court? No one ever says that there's help available, that there are people who care for you. There are services in the community. And so that's why specialty courts work. And that's why I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be, to be a part of the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice Initiative. So the benefits to the justice system and the community with respect to our specialty courts. First of all, we are taking people who otherwise would not have a second chance at life. They may be able to come into the courthouse and get a ticket. They've got a ticket for doing whatever they're doing. But, you know, they're going to get a fine. They will may, maybe do some community service. They'll have to pay some costs. And guess what? They go right back out into the community doing whatever they do. And so those are people that we will oftentimes see uh, 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 repeatedly. They'll be coming over and over and over again. And so what happens with specialty courts, the benefit is, is when an individual, they may get a ticket for something loitering. They may get a ticket for indecent exposure. They may get a ticket for prostitution. Um, you name it, quality of life tickets. But when they come to the court, now we look at them and we say, okay, what's really going on with you? And the thing that I love about my colleagues here at 36 District Court is that there are colleagues who have really embraced specialty courts. And so when they get individuals on their traffic dockets or their, their dockets where otherwise a person would pay a fine and be assessed costs, maybe a little bit of community service, they are asking those questions. They want to know what, what brought you here? Where are you living? What's your educational level? Who's your support system? Are you employed? Are you underemployed? And then they do some testing. And so that's how they kind of 
find out these individuals that may need some specialized care, and then they send them to us. And so how does that benefit the justice system? When those individuals are sent to us, then we have the opportunity not to just address the ticket that brought them into 36th District Court. We get to pull the covers off of the, the whole idea that court is jail and money and a mean judge and people being rude to you. We get to show them that we really do care about you. We want to know what What's going on in your life that causes you to come to court, to have any interaction with the court system? And so when we find out what those issues are, then we begin to address those issues. And so what that does in the justice system is that we have data that shows that it, it, it decreases recidivism, that people don't keep coming back to court because they don't have a driver's license or because they are out there offering sex for money or they're out there buying sex for money. We have shown statistics and data has shown that in specialty court, the numbers of, for recidivism are decreased greatly. And so that is a wonderful thing. How does it benefit the community? It benefits the community because now a person who otherwise would come to us and they pay fines and costs, go back and wreak havoc in the same community or pick a new community and wreak havoc in, or sometimes their, their offenses may graduate, those individuals now, they're with me, they're with me for a minimum of 12 months, they see more of me than they ever want to see. And so I get to know them, they get to know me, they get to know what the judge will tolerate, what the judge won't tolerate, and they get to see the court in a whole different light. And so guess what happens in the community? Now they're going back into their communities and some of them start off, they're like, mm, I can't do the stuff I was doing because I don't want to deal with that judge Holmes because I don't know what bag she's going to come out of. She might have me write a paper. She might have me do community service, but she might send me to jail. And so now they're doing something different in the community. And guess who that benefits? That benefits the community at large. Not only are their actions different in the community because they are interacting with the court on a regular basis, but they also spread the word to their families and to their friends who, who are doing some of the same things that they've done or worse that have brought them into the court system. And we have actually had cases where people have come in and said, I've been in warrant status forever. <laughs> and I heard about specialty court and I wanna get some help because I have issues with X, Y, or Z. And so it certainly benefits the justice system as well as the community. The role of law enforcement in specialty court, we cannot do what we do alone. There is no way that we can. So one of the other great things that has happened under the leadership of Judge McConnell is that we have been able to pull in partners to come to the table and to work with us because everybody has an initiative, right? We wanna reduce drugs. We wanna help people with mental health issues. We wanna help people with that are veterans who have served this country and therefore they have served each one of us. We wanna help people who are out there selling sex for money because they have drug issues. We we want to do all of those things. We want to help the homelessness. And we have all of these people in different pockets throughout the city. The police doing one thing. The legislators doing one thing. Providers are doing one thing. We brought everybody to the table and said, wait a minute, if we are really going to make an impact on the community with respect to the services that are available through specialty court, then we all have to come together. And so we rely on our law enforcement partners, the Wayne County Sheriff's Office under the leadership of Raphael Washington, who have, has been a huge supporter of our program, not just in word, not just in soundbite, but he is at the table getting his hands dirty and assigning his people to work with us in law enforcement. Because when we send people to the jail or when people get picked up and they are brought to the jail and those sheriffs they those deputies they notice that wait a minute this person may have a mental health issue oh wait a minute this person is detoxing so they have a drug issue then they are reaching out to the court and saying court we want to do judge we want to do a direct referral to specialty court instead of that person being in jail and then they get released and then they're back in the streets doing the things that they were doing, whether they're drugging, drinking, whatever they're doing, 
And so now the jail is at the table with us and they are working with us to make sure that we are getting people the help that they need before they even leave the jail, before they even, they, they come to me for arraignment or they come to me once they're referred to specialty court, but we are already connecting and working behind the scenes to help that individual. We also have had the support of Chief Police Chief James White, who has assigned officers to our specialty court. We have the, the privilege of having Officer E and Captain Johnson who work with us. They are at the table with us and they are the ones, they are our eyes and our ears in the community. They are the ones that tell us, Judge, they're not just smoking weed anymore. They're doing manufactured weed. We learned something new the other day that um, folks are getting high with whippets. We had never heard of whippets. And so it's the police, the law enforcement, they are boots on the ground. There are eyes and ears and all of us working together. They bring that information back to us because then now we're able to say, okay, we have someone that keeps testing positive, but they're not using alcohol or we are noticing some strange behavior. And now we know there's something new out there in the streets that folks are doing to get high. And so it takes all of us working together. Not only do we work with law enforcement, but we also work with our treatment providers. We have excellent treatment providers. In our mental health court, we have the Detroit Recovery Project. We also use pop-off. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the treatment that we use uh, with respect to those who are battling opiate uses, usage. And so, but all of our treatment providers, we build relationships with them. Gone are the days where we just send the people out, okay, go get outpatient treatment or go get intensive outpatient treatment. No, we are bringing the providers to the table and we're not sending folks out to get treatment. We are connecting them to our providers so that they can get their specialized treatment so that they can be assessed by a professional. And then we monitor to make sure they're attending that they are engaged and that they are receiving the appropriate services that they need in order to address whatever the underlying issues are that have brought them before third in the 36th district court. The role of the community with respect to specialty courts. We need the community at the table. We have individuals that are at the table that provide training programs for individuals. We have folks that come to us who have never, ever, ever had a job before in their lives. They have never received a paycheck. They've never paid into social security. They don't know anything about budgeting. And so we rely on our community partners for education purposes, for job preparation, for training purposes, for our skilled trades. And so it takes everybody coming to the table to really, really work with us. In the slide, I saved the role of the judiciary for last because some people would think that that would be very, very important. But at the end of the day, the real heavy lifting, by the time they get to me, the real heavy lifting has been done. Uh, Mr. Wade has already put dispatched his team to work with and to assess and to connect to resources, whether it's the person needs parenting classes, whether they are underemployed, whether they want to go back to college, whether the individual uh, needs anger management, whether the individual is in a volatile relationship and now they need shelter or they need services for their children or they've been separated from their children and now we need to reunify the, uh, the, the family. And so when it gets to me, what I get to do, and I summarize my job really easy, it's real simple. I get to order you to fix your life. That is my job. I get to order you, I get to get all of this professional experience from law enforcement, the treatment providers, the community, as well as and Mr. Wade and his team, they really shepherd this work, oversee this work, and I get to put it in a nice order and say, these are the things that you are going to do in order to become the person that we know that you are capable of becoming. And so specialty courts work. And it's important to know how all of these pieces come together because it's not just one person. It's everybody hands on deck working to make sure that we service the individuals that come before us. We can go to the next slide. All right. I want to talk a little bit about, uh oh hmm. here we go. Medication assisted treatment. Listen, for some people who may be in this seminar today, when I first heard of MAT, we're going to keep going. Listen, MAT, 
the first thing I did was I cringed. I said, wait a minute, why would we have someone in drug treatment court or any of our specialty courts that are dealing with some form of drug addiction? Why would we support another drug, right? That was my first, my first take on everything is that, no, I want to do it without medicine because guess what, y'all? I don't eat meat. I don't take medicine. I go to the integrative doctor. I'm real holistic. I do all of those wonderful things. But here's the reality of it. The lack of knowledge really would have put me in a position where I would not have been able to help a very vulnerable population. There are individuals who actually need MAT treatment, medication assisted treatment. And so what happened was I started getting educated about, okay, what is it? How, why, why do you recommend it? And then what I realized is the reason why I had so much disdain for medication assisted treatment and I had an opportunity to serve on an opioid task force that was put together by the governor's office. What I realized was that first of all, I wasn't educated on it enough. And then secondly, monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. Guess what? As the court, as the judge, I get to monitor. I get to determine, okay, what are the things that need to be done to give me a comfort level that I am providing the best services to the people who are standing before me? And so this, what you see on the slide today is what we put together after I attended the opioid task force of how I'm going to monitor individuals that need medication assisted treatment. First of all, the judge, I never, I never sentenced someone to MAT. It is not the appropriate thing to do, according to the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. So if you don't like that, you can call them up. But it's not the appropriate thing to do. Because as the judge, I'm not there to carry out medication functions. That is for the professional in that area. And so what I am required to do and what I do have the ability to do is to monitor. And so if an individual is assessed, by one of our clinicians or one of our assessors, and it is determined that this is, this is an individual who would benefit from MAT, and that individual agrees that they want to do MAT. I have not forced one person to do MAT. And oftentimes what will happen is when they've tried and they are really trying, and they are really trying real, real hard, and they've been battling their addiction for so long, Oftentimes through their counseling and through their therapy, they will learn from their, their therapist or from their doctor that, or the doctor that's assessing them and overseeing it, um, that MAT is something that would be appropriate for them and they get education on it and they request it. And so if the doctor recommends it and the party agrees to it, then guess what? They are going to do medication assisted treatment. Why do, I, why do I agree with that now when at first I was on this, the side of, I'm not going to have a person go from one drug to another drug. I'm not going to do that. I promise you, I was the poster child for that. And now my views have changed because of education. The reason, one of the reasons is that I started seeing the improved long-term outcomes where individuals who have been battling drug addiction or battling alcoholism, when the, when the professional recommended MAT and the individual agreed to participate through no order of the court, then what I started noticing is that person was not falling off as often as they had been. And that person started realizing, wait a minute, I am really moving into recovery and my cravings have been reduced and I'm able to really work my program. And so that's one of the reasons why my position changed. Also, I learned that if I refused to let people do MAT treatment, it could impact my federal funding. And certainly I need money to run these programs. I also noticed that individuals that do MAT, that the recidivism, they weren't going out there because oftentimes, here's the cycle I would see. I would see they would come to, to specialty court. They were trying so hard. They had been trying for 15, 20 years and they felt hopeless. 
They saw, I, I've had people say to me, I thought I was going to die out here. I thought that this would be my death sentence. I never, we just graduated a class last Friday and um, I have a, a, a person who I hold near and dear and I'll just call, just call her BJ. And um, she said to me, she comes back, it wasn't her graduation, but she comes back on for graduations. And she said to the graduates, she said, I thought I would die out there. I never thought I would live to, to get this old, to gain weight, to be reunited with my family because my drug addiction was so horrible and I had tried everything. And what the cycle usually is, is when they tried so hard and then they failed and then they come to me and now they're trying and there's no MAT in place, maybe they've refused it or a doctor has not recommended it. And then what happens is when they go out there and they use, guess what? Usually they, they commit some other crime or they do something else, right? And so I, you have to look at MAT, when I started looking at it, that it certainly reduced the rate of recidivism with respect to the individuals who have been trying for what they considered a lifetime to be drug addiction. And the other thing that I learned with MAT was that Listen, there are people that have been in my program who we have had some close calls. We've had some close calls. They get clean for 30 days because they've been in inpatient treatment and they believe, hey, I can do it. And you know, there, there's state legislation that governs how long they can stay in inpatient treatment. So they get out 28, 29 days, and then they go back and they, they're like, well, I'm just gonna do one hit. We've had some close calls. We've had at least three people who have had to go to the hospital by way of the paramedics because they could not be revived on the scene and we almost lost them. Mm -hmm. And so when you allow MAT treatment, again, doctor's orders, the participant agrees to do it, then what happens is it has reduced the number of overdose deaths because I have three people that I almost lost. And they are three people that I helped near, I think I hold all of them near and dear to my heart. But they were, they were young people who did not see themselves ever beating addiction, had been clean for 30 days, went out and, and thought they were doing just a little bit. But when your system has been clean for 30 days and you do just a little bit, it may just be your last time doing just a little bit. And so what I have found is that with medication assisted treatment, we have had a reduction at least with respect to individuals overdosing and coming close to death and certainly therefore a reduction in an overdose deaths. So one of the things that we do at 36 District Court, and this was a little check sheet that was put together by Samaj Morgan, who serves as our specialty court coordinator extraordinaire. Um, once we did the opioid task force, I said, put together a check sheet of what we need to know for individuals that are in, in MAT treatment. I can't order them to it. And I can't, you know, I'm not a doctor. I can't say they need it. But once the doctor says they need it, the individual has agreed to it, then this is, these are the things that I can control. Who's going to prescribe that MAT? Who's going to administer it? I can control, okay, who's making the determination? So first of all, the participant must have a clinical assessment by a licensed and certified provider. And so that has to happen. They don't just get to come in and say, oh, I want methadone or, oh, I want buprenorphine. I want this. I want Suboxone. They don't get to come in and say that because I'm aware that those things, those medications can be used to get high. So I don't let the participant just come in and say, this is the laundry list of things I want to take. They must undergo a clinical assessment. And then I can also determine that what are the qualifications of that person who is doing the, the assessment and who is going to be doing the administration of the MAT. And so CAR and then the JCAHO, that stands for Joint Commission on Accreditation Health Care Organizations. They have to be certified and licensed. And so I make sure that that provider fits those qualifications. I require, the, uh, still, I'm staying in the role of the judge. I have not crossed over into being a doctor at all. I'm still in my lane, but there are some things that I can do in order to help me with my, the, what, what I had, I called my insecurities about MAT. 
And so the other thing that we do is we require a treatment plan. You should not have a person receiving MAT without a treatment plan. I wanna know after you have assessed that person, What's your diagnosis? What is your prognosis? What are the levels that you're giving that person for MAT? Um, why are you giving them at those levels? And I want it in layman's terms so that I can understand it. Because again, I am not a doctor. And so I want to know how long are they going to be on it? What's your plan for a reduction? All of those things. And when you have a doctor or a facility that wants to do the right thing and they're doing it for the right reason, they have no issue with giving you this information. Not only do I get that treatment plan, but that treatment plan has to be updated every 90 days. Every 90 days, I wanna know, has that person been hitting their mark? Um, are they reporting? Well, first of all, if they're not reporting to take their medication the way that they should, so that it could be administered pursuant to the treatment plan, that doctor is required to reach out to the case manager who they are already in contact with and they're talking with them as often as the person is coming to court. So if an individual is coming every two weeks, that case manager is reaching out to that provider every two weeks if they're coming every 30 days. So that case manager is getting updates, little progress reports. Is the person showing up? Um, is the person showing up for their therapy as well? Because I do not allow MAT to be administered by a provider who is not examining or assessing the individual that's in the program on a regular basis. You will not just get to write prescriptions and just send them out the door or give them 90 days of Suboxone strips and send them out the door. It's not going to happen, not at 36 District Court, not with Judge Shannon A. Holmes. We don't allow it. You have to be assessing that person, meeting with that person, providing some, ther some therapy to that individual so that you can know if you see something off or if you see that, okay, wait a minute, you, we, we tested you when you came in today and your levels are not where they should be. That's all about relationship and all of us working together. So those are things that are all a part of the treatment plan, which is updated every 30 days, as well as the progress reports that are given verbally, as well as in writing by the provider. And so again, the treatment, the, uh, treatment plan provides a level of care that's recommended, and that is solely at the discretion of the professional. And I do respect that but they have to update the court on how that treatment is going, whether or not the individual is participating, whether or not the individual is hitting their goals or what have you. And so that those are things um, that, that I've put in place to make sure that I'm good with MAT. And so I also want to know how does the provider monitor MAT distribution? Um, are they coming into the facility? and they're administering. Is the person taking a shot once a month? Um, are they being given strips? What, what's being done? Because we need to know, because I want that provider to tell me that, wait a minute, you know, somebody came to me, I gave them a, a five day supply, and on day number three, they reported to the clinic because they needed more medication. Well, a couple of things may be happening. They could be selling it or they could be abusing it. And so that's why that relationship with your MAT provider is so important. They must be at the table. They must be in communication. And of course, that's going to be with the consent of the participant. All right, I am going to leave a few minutes for q and I think there's only one more slide or we can go to Q&A. Yes, there's a question about how do you, how do we ensure that if a defendant goes to jail, that they continue to receive the medicated assisted treatment. And so that is an excellent question. And that's why relationship is everything. We communicate with the Wayne County Jail on first name basis, the Sergeant Coho. We communicate, Director Bomer, we communicate with them. This individual is MAT and we need to make sure it goes on the MIT or the committal papers for the jail so that they can continue with their MAT treatment because we don't want to disrupt their treatment. Excellent question. I think, Judge, it's also a good time that we could also uh, explain about how we have a warm handoff. If a, if a participant is in our program and for whatever reason they end up in the emergency room, 
then the emergency room, once they get them to baseline, is not going to discharge them and they walk out of the door. It's going to be a warm handoff from the hospital, either directly to law enforcement or directly to a provider. Because yes. if not, we'll lose the defendant. Yes. So it was a process getting there. But we are there. And a warm handoff will happen so that it does not open the door for a defendant, a participant, to go right back out in harm's way. Yes. And, and Mr. Wade is being very modest about all of the work that he did to make sure uh, that we fixed. That was a huge, uh, uh, a huge glitch in the program where individuals would go to the hospital, they'd get some drugs, they'd be baseline, and they'd be released to the streets. And Mr. Wade, along with Mr. Doey, uh, who serves as the CEO at Detroit Wade Integrative Health Network and his team, they were able to stop that revolving door mm -hmm. so that now when an individual goes to the hospital, that there is a warm handoff, they're not getting baselined and then put back out on the streets to do what? Go and get drugs. And so that is very, very important. Thank you, Mr. Wade. Absolutely. Uh, excuse me, a couple other questions here. If we have a couple minutes more to go. Um, do you contract, does the court contract with a specific MAT provider or is it based on a person's insurance or a little bit of both maybe? It's a little bit of both. Mr. Wade, I'll start off with right now, our MAT provider is pop off. And so, but again, if individuals have private insurance, then we certainly give deference to where their insurance will take them but still the requirements are the same with respect to reporting. Yep. Another quick question, uh, the cost for these treatments, are they born, who pays for the treatments, MAT treatments? So 95, and Mr. Wade, I'll, I'll let you go ahead. Go ahead, because that's an administrative <laughs> you, question. You, know, you know, I get so excited, go ahead. <laughs> well, um, we, we go through, um, Judge, what is it? Detroit Wayne County Integrated Health which is the, the primary network uh, where people that are underinsured or uninsured and unemployed uh, qualify. And we also have uh, grant funding. And between those sources, uh, that's what's used unless a person has private insurance, but no one has been denied. We, have any, we don't have anyone that has been denied uh, treatment because of lack of payment. Very good. I have another uh, question here from uh, uh, any suggestions on streamlining communication amongst team members. Our team utilizes emails often and sometimes these become cumbersome. Treatment, probation, legal, court members meet once a week via Zoom to discuss each case as well. Striving to balance time management and providing adequate detail to each case is a challenge. Any, any lessons learned about how you kind of streamline the communications? Well, I will say this, if we figure it out, somebody needs to put it in a book and we need to scout <laughs> it. Because in specialty court, when you're dealing with people who have issues and life, and we're not just dealing with the, the charge, we're dealing with the individual, it, it's tough to streamline. What I will tell you that has worked for us is that we, uh, we staff multiple times during the week. And I know that, that that takes time. With a full docket, we do, we, we staff. Um, we also are accessible to each other through email, but we, we like to do face-to-face. -face. We might do email just as a precursor so that when we do all come together, we're not, you're not having to read all of the dirty details. We can now talk about uh, resolutions and things of that nature, but to streamline, we've been trying to figure it out. And that's the one thing when you're dealing with lives, it, it's, it's tough. So yep. if you figure it out, put it in the book for us. We will buy it. <laughs> It, ta it takes a lot of sacrifice. It, it takes a lot of sacrifice, a lot of flexibility, and a lot of patience. Yeah. Uh, another question here is, uh, and I think, uh, Director Wade, you talked about this. Could you talk a little bit about the role that uh, the recovery coaches have played and have you found them to be helpful? They're very helpful and they, they, they are essential to all the specialty courts. But what I found to be very pertinent is the timing. We, you want to get them involved sooner than later so that they can become, they can learn the person, to learn the person's strengths and weaknesses and ensure that they are compatible. Because you might have to switch up on the, the peer re recovery coaches because they might not be compatible. So you want to you want to start that process sooner than later. So by the time that we're no longer 
connected with them, they have a good, solid rapport and relationship with the person that's going to take over. Have you found it, Director Wade, any difficulty with peer recovery uh, people who are maybe abstinence-based people versus those who may be in, so they may not be a supportive of MAT programming? Is there any kind of uh, challenge that way? Well, it's kind of worked both ways. Some people really adapt and they're real compatible with someone that they feel has had the same challenges that they've had. They can better relate. Then we've had it happen just the opposite way. We, we've had those that they don't want to deal with a peer recovery coach because they've never had this challenge. They can't understand me. They don't know what it is. I, I don't want to deal with them. So that's, that's where that compatibility piece comes in. Very good. I'm going to try one more question here. Uh, I'll read it as it's written here. So I thought I heard Mr. Wade uh, say that the goal is to wean people down or off MAT. Is that correct? Research indicates that people be not be weaned off of MAT unless they ask to be taken off and it is discussed at length with the provider. Research shows that people on MAT two years or more are the most successful. Um, I didn't hear that necessarily, but was that something that the- I, I, I did infer that. And I inferred that based on our actual experience. Um, and Judge, I believe you remember this particular uh, resident um, that came to us on mat and she was with us for such a long period of time. And then when we found out the particular dosage and that it never ever lowered. And once there was some communication with the physician, it started and that's how she got off. And until they start to lower it, she was absolutely dependent upon it. So it is a case by case basis. Right. But we couldn't understand as long as she had been on it, why, why the dosage never decreased. So we posed that question to the physician and the physician start to lower it. It's, and it's, and then by the time she left us, she was off. But I, I just want to clarify so that, that whoever asked that question, it's not a court order that the person has to be uh, weaned off or that it has to be reduced. But what I have found is that when we started doing the checklist and we're monitoring, now it's on the forefront, like the example that Mr. Wade gave, we just asked the question and the doctor started reducing her. Yeah. Because Right. We just asked the question. And so now we, we do re recognize that it, it is the doctor that has to make that determination, you know, with the patient, right? But we, we're noticing that we don't have anybody now that's just on, you know, high doses and they've been with us two years and they're getting ready to leave us and they're still at the high doses. Not because the court has ordered it, but it has been at the hands of the professional, in the hands of the professional. Uh, another question here, if you have another time, I know your honor, you have to get to the bench. Um, but uh, any recommendations for non-specialty courts and support defendants participation in an MAT program? I'm sorry, say your question one more time. What are your recommendations for non-specialty courts to support defendants participation in an MAT program? Well, I don't believe that you have to be in a specialty court to do MAT. Um, DWIN is available when I say DWIN, so I deal with Wayne County mostly, majority, uh, Detroit Wayne Integrative Health Network. Um, once they do that assessment and they get before uh, a provider, it doesn't have to be specialty court. And so that's one of the things that I have recommended uh, to other judges is to utilize those services. What I will tell you is I wouldn't do it if I didn't have the time to dedicate to monitoring and making sure that I'm just not sending people to get on MAT and now it becomes another source of, of being able to use drugs. Well, Mr. Lindsay from uh, DWIN uh, participated in this and, and, and I know he says he, he participates in the specialty court. So uh, it, it is a great partnership and it's evidenced by Mr. Lindsay joining us today. Thank uh, you. Turn, turn this back over to Becca to, for our closing comments. and. Uh, let the judge and Mr. Wade get back to their to their other more important work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you both so very much. That was a very powerful presentation. Um, and I am just in awe of both of you, actually. Oh, you so um, and we appreciate so much your expertise, your commitment to the community and your passion for serving others. Thank you to everyone else who joined us today for the second of these three trainings. 
This webinar will be shared as a course on the Improving Michigan Practices website in the near future. We will also send a copy of the slides and any related materials to all attendees as soon as we can. Please keep an eye out for future events in this series. The webinars will be held every other month with the next one scheduled for May. Thank you all and be well. Thank, Thank you. you. Be well. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Director. It's Thank you. Very, very powerful stuff. It's Thank just you. It was an awesome experience. Yes. Thank you.